Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us for this um, business first conversation regarding access to capital. Uh, these discussions that we have are actually sponsored by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, so we want to be sure to thank them for their support on this. My name is Petey Stefanik, and I'm part of the Southwest Michigan First team. Um, this Business First series was really dis, dis, yeah, <laughs> invented for you to help strengthen and grow small businesses in our community. We really try to address topics that are important to you and that will move your business and your efforts forward. So we bring together um, and share the knowledge of experts to support your small business and focus on your topics. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please use the chat box. We'll be referencing that and looking for questions from you along the way. We will, we will be sharing those with these speakers as we get to the end of each one of their sections. And then we will have some time at the end, hopefully, for a little bit of open discussion and some other general questions. Um, as you might have noticed, we are recording the session. So we will be sharing this information with everyone who is registered. So you can take notes, but do be aware that you'll be receiving uh, all the contact information and all the content uh, and a separate email once we're finished. So let's go ahead and get ready for today's topic of access to capital. Today, um, we have five guests that we'll be hearing from and really looking at different sources of funding for you and how, how to support your business. First, we'll hear from uh, Tamara Davis from the Small Business Development Center. We will hear from uh, Mel Dakin and Molly Trueblood from the City of Kalamazoo and United Way. We'll hear from Kip Higgins with Huntington Bank to talk about um, traditional le lending options. And then we'll have Dale Grogan talk a little bit about options for angel investing. So the format for today is each one of our speakers will share their, their information about their specific funding sources and uh, try to answer most of your questions, and then we'll move on to the next. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started and welcome to the stage, Tamara Davis. Thank you. Let me, did I share my screen? Did it work? Not yet. Oh, sorry. There, there we go. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you, PD. Again, I'm Tamara Davis. I'm the regional director of the SPDC at Western Michigan University. Um, let me just get this going. There we go. Here's my contact information, and I'll have this again at the end of the presentation if you missed it at this point. But what I first let me tell you a little bit about the SPDC. It is funded through the U.S. Small Business Administration and the state of Michigan to provide businesses with um, our small businesses with good information. We help you make good decisions. We help you determine if your uh, business startup is feasible, if you're interested in growing, if, if the this is a good time. We help you develop your strategic plan. And even if you're buying or selling a business, we're going to help you through that process also. As you can see, we are across the state of Michigan. There is 10 different offices. We cover all 83 counties. And the important part is that our services are provided to you at no cost. So as I talk to you today and talk to you about different opportunities that we have available, recognize that these are provided to our clients at no fee to you because of our funding through the MEDC and the state of Michigan. So over the, um, over the past 13 years of me being the regional director of the S SBDC, I've been able to experience the ebb and flow of our economy. And right now we are starting to see a little bit, you know, I Obviously, through COVID, we're coming out of COVID and consumers are considering or spending, it's consumer spending is on the rise. People are interested in shopping, they're interested in shopping online, in your stores and so forth. It's excellent for our small businesses if you have the capital in order to um, fund working capital for your inventory, if you have your employees and so forth, and that you have the inventory necessary in order to fill the needs and wants of our customers. And just to put this in perspective, so that as we talk about all that we have to offer you today, whether it's myself or the other speakers, is that we got to recognize that our real gross domestic um, purchases in the United States has been growing exponentially. In the second quarter of this year, it was up 6.7% and up in this third quarter, an additional 2%. The, but one kicker that we have to recognize is that the consumer price index is up 4.4%. And this means that people are buy, or yeah, they're spending 
what they spend is going to be 4.4% higher on common goods than what they had to spend on them last year. So inflation. And inflation itself in September was up 5.4%. So people are paying more. They're wanting to shop, but they're paying more for their products and services. And part of this is because obviously some of the issues that we're experiencing, which is staffing issues, accessing employees. And in Southwest Michigan, the seven counties of Southwest Michigan that both the SPDC and the um, Southwest Michigan first cover, our unemployment rate right now is between 4% and 4.4%, depending on what county you're in. And you recognize that when the unemployment rate it dips below 5.5%, it becomes an employee market, meaning there's more jobs than people to cover them. And depending on the industry that you're in, because I know we have a wealth of different people on this call, you're experiencing different levels of this stress. Additionally, there's supply chain or disruptions. We recognize that, you know, there's a lack of, uh, truckers. There's a lack of people in the warehouses if, if actually the cargo ships are able to port and, and disbark um, the, to get this, get this products outside into the United States. Right now, the Long Beach and the port of Los Angeles have 83 tanker ships waiting to port and, and disbark. The problem with that is they're out in sea actually 16 days on average right now. Usually they were in, they would be at sea or they would come into the port and within a day they would actually empty their cargo ships and, and leave. So you can see where that congestion is, is essentially accumulating. And both of those ports have actually opened access to the, the cargo ships 24 seven as of November 1st. So it will start um, alleviating itself, this congestion, but it's gonna take some time. And we gotta recognize that as you're planning that you can see that there's gonna be supply chain or disruptions probably up to the middle of 2023. So with that in mind, the idea of just-in-time inventory management is something that we have to reconsider. You want to start looking at possibly having larger, larger amounts of inventory on hand. And what does that mean for you? This is where the SBDC comes into play. So we've talked about three different things, staffing issues, supply chain issues. And the last thing is if you're going to have to hold more inventory or if you're going to have to increase wages or some other aspect in order Order to attract employees, you're probably going to need access to capital. And so that's where we can help you determine what level of funding do you need? Do you need a larger line of credit? Do you need a commercial loan? Um, with the SBDC, we can actually use some of the programs that we have in place to help you review your financials, figure out what your pricing model should be in line with all the different economic situations that are occurring so that you have an idea of what your pricing policy should be, what your cost of goods are going to look like, your staffing, and so forth. So as a client of the SBDC, we can help you go through that. And we also have, you know, we're looking at going into 2022 and it's time to start looking at what our strategic plan is. And so we have a focus four program, which essentially goes through all aspects of your business, including the financial review to help you develop your strategic plan for not just 2022, but on. And, um, Let's see here, let me give you. So it goes through the vision, strategy, execution, cash flow, and so forth. And we work with you through your time frame in order to accomplish this. So with that being said, um, I want to give you my information again and recognize that with the SBDC, there's going to be a number of speakers today. And one of the things that we do is we keep abreast of all the different programs that are available through the federal, state, or local governments um, and to share that information with our clients. And we also help you access the capital that Kip is going to be talking about in a couple of minutes. We help you get your loan package together and approach the financial institutions that best meet your needs. So with that, if you have any questions, let me know. Great. You know, thank you, Tamara. One question. Um, when people call into the SBDC, are they um, connected with one primary contact? Or is it a general number? How do you suggest that people go ahead and get engaged? Sure. The first thing, actually, you can either call our office and talk about 
your particular situation and see if we're able to help you. Or you can go online right here on our on the screen is our SBDC michigansbdc.org website and you can register for services. Once you register for services, someone will call you within 24 hours. It's either they're going to call you or email you. And usually we try to call, but of course, most of our calls go to people's voicemail. So we will follow up with an email. Now with that, I want to be cognizant of one thing. We are sending these emails out from Western Michigan University, which is an EDU email address. And if you have Gmail, a lot of times for whatever reason, um, our information goes into your spam. So if you haven't received an email or a call from us, check your spam because it might be right in there. But once you get into our program, then you are assigned a consultant and that consultant is your primary contact. And he or she will connect you with, we have actually a total of, well, 12 consultants in this region, but overall we have over 120 consultants statewide that have different um, areas of expertise. And if we need to draw one of those in, your primary lead consultant will bring that person in to help you. That's great. One another question. If you are um, just starting your business and you're setting up your financial information, um, is, is there a support that you have to train people on either Excel or QuickBooks or all those other um, options? Or is there support along those lines? Um, actually, that's a good question. Uh, during COVID, as a result of CARES Act funding, we did have those services in place. But that actually is the, you know, the CARES Act program is ending. So we do not have that per se. We would refer people to appropriate accountants, bookkeepers, CPAs that we're aware of in the community that would be able to help them. But that would be at a fee that those individuals, the private sector charges. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And sure. uh, if you have questions, um, Tamara, that was just great information and a great starting point. Um, if you have questions for any of the speakers, general questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We will address those as we can. And we'll have some, again, we'll have some general comments at the end. So thank you so much for that. So uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to our next speaker. And Molly, is going, Molly Trueblood with United Way, it's going to go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the funding options that are available through the community and United Way. Thanks, Petey, and thanks uh, Southwest Michigan First and our fellow panelists for having us here. Um, I am Melody Dakin, unfortunately, couldn't make it today, so I'm going to be covering um, our section. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about our collaborative programs um, with the City of Kalamazoo and um, Foundation for Excellence. Um, but first, I'll talk a little bit about United Way. Um, I know that I'm not going to read our mission vision values for you, but um, we are acting in a little bit of a different space. Um, but our motivation behind this comes from supporting working families and supporting the Alice population. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's an asset limited income constrained and employed um, folks in our community or what might be called the working poor. So we do focus our programs on serving that population, but all of our programs are open to anyone. Um, right now it's limited for the city of Kalamazoo. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about why it matters to United Way um, to do this. So um, our um, three small business programs um, are new um, as of 2020, as of COVID. Um, the first program that was created um, was um, a City of Kalamazoo response to COVID. Um, they created with us a low interest loan program through some of the relief dollars and Foundation for Excellence. Um, we worked through that in about April and May of 2020. And um, as I mentioned, we wanna focus on Alice population, which tends to be disproportionately um, black and indigenous people of color. Um, and so we were trying to target the loans for those folks and not really seeing um, much take up um, in the demographics. So the city and, and we came back together with FFE and talked about creating a $5,000 microenterprise grant program. So that serves um, very small businesses with just a operational grant of 5,000. Um, and we did see much better response um, in kind of our underserved populations through that grant. 
Um, and uh, because uh, that worked well um, during the first part of COVID, um, we are under currently a three-year agreement with the city um, and FFE to administer the loan program and the microenterprise grant. Um, I'll talk about kind of those programs in just a second, but want to make sure um, everybody's clear on kind of how long our funding is available. Um, we do think that we'll be working with the city to brainstorm how this kind of programming could be used um, elsewhere in the future, or what it might morph into, um, but we're not there yet. So um, <clears throat> again, um, tying it back to our um, connection to Alice, um, we want to particularly serve um, businesses that have not been served by other financial institutions. So we often work with people who don't um, maybe have a bank account, but have never looked at financing through a bank. Um, and so we try to make our programs as low barrier as possible and as accessible as possible. Um, again, a lot of our programs were started around COVID. So if you're accessing some of our websites or materials, you'll see questions around that. Um, we do prioritize particularly for the microenterprise grants, um, the $5,000 grants, sorry. I'll try to keep my jargon at a limited amount. <laughs> um, we do prioritize uh, folks who identify as um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC, um, women owners, um, the shared prosperity Kalamazoo neighborhoods of Eastside, Edison, and Northside, um, and again, Alice households. Um, and part of the reason the city and we wanted to continue our programming was because we, we started the program as a response to COVID. And as we all know, since we're still doing Zoom, COVID has not left us. So we, we know that businesses continue to struggle to access capital um, and we wanna be part of that impact. Um, so again, I said, uh, it's a partnership with the city and Foundation for Excellence. This is why the funding that we have currently is limited to the city of Kalamazoo because they're a funder. Um, we do, um, particularly for the grants and the loans um, that we have, we request um, to try to make it more community-based. Um, we have a committee of volunteers who review the loan applications and make the decisions on who to award grants to. Um, these are folks from the community who have business experience and bring good perspective from women and BIPOC owners as well. Um, and I think importantly for United Way, um, you know, I would say that my approach to this work is continuous learning and continuous improvement. Um, but the main goal that we're working on now for all of our grant programs is to really infuse trust-based philanthropy um, into our all of our work. Um, so we have on our website, which I will share just momentarily, um, we do report on all of our um, outcomes, all of the folks we are we have funded are on our web pages, um, and we do report um, monthly and annually to the city about who we're funding, um, what businesses we're accessing, and how. And we talk about how we might um, improve that. Um, so I want to also highlight that that's an important aspect of um, our programs that we want to have a dialogue with the owner and with um, all and kind of have a team approach with all the other business service organizations. So currently we have three programs. I just put in the chat a link to where you can access um, information for all three of those. Um, so as I mentioned, the loan fund um, was the first program we had. Um, those loans should be available anytime between now and early 2024. Um, our agreement with the city went into effect around April or May in um, 2021 this year. So that's about when the, the contract would be up for renegotiation. We are going to service the loans since they're three years, so out to 2027. So it's it's likely that loan program will continue in some shape. Um, we do have a small grant right now that's um, the Health Protection Grant. Um, it's a reimbursement for costs that were unexpected because of COVID, um, but are required to keep your business open. Um, these are grants up uh, reimbursement grants, excuse me, up to two thousand five hundred dollars, and then. Um, the microenterprise grant program we have done so far in 2020 and 2021 once per year. Um, and we found that this uh, created an unnecessary barrier for some folks who um, we do have some requirements for documentation 
um, that the business is open at least one year. And we were missing some people by days um, on our grant deadlines, which was really arbitrary and not very fair to the businesses. So um, we've uh, worked with the city to renegotiate our agreement around that. And this um, coming year in 2022, we're gonna try two grant rounds, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. And we will definitely um, post that on our website and social media. So we haven't determined the dates yet, but we're working on it. Um, so I wanna cover the eligibility criteria um, in terms of what it would take to apply for our programs. So because again, the funding is from the city of Kalamazoo, um, the business must be located in the city limits. Um, I have a handy tool, I can search your address or you can, so I'll share that in the chat also. Um, just, I, th I think the main reason, I wasn't involved in the discussions, but the main reason the business must be in operation at least one year is limiting the city's risk, honestly. Um, and uh, I know that there's kind of a gap in some startup funding. Um, we're getting as close as we can at the moment, but we are continuing to work with the city on, um, you know, what we could do for businesses under one year. Um, and then finally, uh, oh, sorry, not finally. Um, that um, recognition of business operation in one year could come through a business uh, or government document like your EIN tax filing, your LLC filing, a DBA. Um, we just want to make sure that the business is operating um, legitimately. Um, and we do, because it's city funding, um, request at least one year of taxes um, provided with the application. Um, the loan program and the health protection grant, um, that's the 2000, the reimbursement grant, um, they have kind of higher threshold of eligibility in terms of employees and revenues. Um, so 50 employees or fewer and two and a half million dollars or less um, in revenues are kind of our upper limit for the loan program and the reimbursement grant. Um, the reimbursement grant is actually a pass through of federal money to us. So um, federal government requires all grantees to have a DUNS number. Um, if you don't have it, it's very easy to get. I can help you with that. And then the microenterprise grant, um, as, it, as the name kind of implies, um, it's for smaller businesses. So we lower the threshold um, of employees and revenues a bit for that one. Um, again, trying to target kind of the smallest businesses um, who maybe really have struggled to access any capital, maybe unbanked at this time. Uh, so um, wanted to focus on the loan fund relative to our discussion today. So um, the loans that we have available are three-year loans. Um, it's 1% annual interest um, and can be used for any business operating expense working capital. Um, the loan amounts are between 5,000 and 50,000 um, and we don't collect any payments at the beginning uh, for the first six months to kind of allow the business owner to build back some capital before payments. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, um, we have a team of seven volunteers from the community, including bankers and lawyers who look at your applications um, and help us come to a consensus decision um, around the loan amount. So uh, just want to add some in extra information from the city side, um, from the Community Planning and Economic Development Department. Um, so they also have a business development fund um, that is also targeted to serving underserved businesses and um, helping businesses get started in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, so they have sponsorship grants um, and technical assistance grants. I believe they only have the technical assistance grants available for the remainder of this year. Um, but there's an application on this uh, for each of these programs on this website that you can take a look at, um, that you can take a look at the applications and see what would be required in the future. So they also have funding for facade improvements. So the outside of your building um, or white box build out. So for the inside. Um, and here's our contact information, um, my email and phone number and mails also from the city. Um, thanks again, everybody. I didn't see the chat, so I will let PD tell me what people yeah. asked. Um, we do have one question in the chat and then I've got some others. Um, does eligibility include newly acquired businesses where the business being purchased had been operating more than a year? So change of ownership. Yeah, yeah, I think we would, um, 
we would request some documentation around that. But yeah, we have worked with businesses who have been acquired or, you know, purchased um, during the uh, years of operation. So that's okay. And then as far as the, the loan fund, how long does it take to be approved and to actually receive the capital? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so I would say, honestly, that I try to offer support through the application period. Um, we do request a couple financial documents, um, a balance sheet of profit and loss that some folks don't have yet. So that's the main assistance I've been providing recently. Um, so that can add a little bit of time to the application process. But once it's submitted, generally it's about 10 days before we can get a decision back from the review committee. Um, and then it's another week or so to get the paperwork done and then another week to get the loans deposit the loan funds deposited in the account. So it's generally three, I tell people three to four weeks between when you submit the application and when you could get the funds deposited. Actually pretty quick. Um, that's that's good news. Uh, question on the health protection grant um, or information. You know, what type of challenges on that? You know, you're talking about expenses that were incurred during the pandemic, mm -hmm. what 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 type of things does that actually cover? Mm -hmm. That's a good question too. Thanks. Um, <laughs> that would cover um, anything. At, really, I have to be able to tie it to COVID somehow. So I try to be liberal, <laughs> but what it's intended to cover is um, personal protective equipment, primarily. So mask, gloves, any of the plexiglass shields that people have put up around the cashier stations. Those would work. Um, any like process or um, infrastructural improvements that you had to do to protect um, employees or customers from interacting. So I've even accepted things like Zoom account subscriptions if it's for business um, or like if you had to take online ordering, that's a good thing that would keep people apart during COVID. Um, other things like temperature checks, um, readers, um, any training for employees, um, air filters would work. Um, again, as long as I can tie it to COVID somehow, then we can make it work probably. We are actually running a campaign on our, um, like our social medias right now that gives examples of um, what those expenses are. So I'll find a link and drop it in the chat for folks later. That would be wonderful. We'll go ahead and include that also with the uh, follow-up email. Thank you. Those are those are great things. I can just see all those dots on the floor. Or your stand six feet apart signs, right? All those <laughs> yeah. things. Those are great. Um, I don't see any more questions right now in the chat box, Molly. But we really appreciate everything that you just shared. Really great information and uh, so many options, right, to the city. Um, and you did mention that the city. And you mentioned the business in the city. Can you clarify if you, do you have to live in the city as well? Is it just for the business? How, what's that relationship? Um, it's most difficult if your like LLC registered address is outside the city. Um, if you have a Kalamazoo license, we ask for an ID to be submitted with the applications really to prevent fraud. Um, well, if that address is city of Kalamazoo and if it's on your taxes as a uh, city of Kalamazoo address, I can usually make it work. I do try to work with people because, you know, folks in Ashtamo sell primarily in Kalamazoo. That kind of stuff always happens. Um, it can be tricky. Sometimes there's no way to work around it, but I would never recommend that you change your address just for our programs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe get you... like a storage shed in Kalamazoo and then we'll use that one next year or something like that. Yes. But, but you could live somewhere else as long as your business mm -hmm. is, is in the city of Kalamazoo. I need to have some piece of paper with a Kalamazoo address on it, yep. Awesome, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that great information. And again, I don't see any other questions right now, so we will move on and then come back if we need to, but thank you so, so much. So now we've heard about some great funding from the city and from um, the United Way, as well as uh, the Small Business Development Center and how they can help. So now let's go into more traditional loans. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Kip Higgins with Huntington Bank to kind of give us an overview of more traditional setups. Thanks, Beatty. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna kind of touch on, um, you know, a few different, um, areas of loans that we can do. Um, the conventional is what we, um, you know, what most banks do. And then, 
um, kind of dovetail into what uh, Tamara was talking in regards to the SBDC and what we uh, utilize the SBA um, for a lot of our um, acquisition loans or for uh, startups. And, um, and then also there's a program that Huntington has that I'll um, share some information it's on, the, on, the, on the smaller end and has um, a little bit um, wider parameters. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about some of the things that um, any bank would need to look at for any of these types of requests. So, so when we first talk about um, conventional loans, um, you know, this is basically for established businesses. Um, and I, we would say established businesses are been in business for at least three years. Um, and we'd be working off of the uh, historical cash flow that the fact that this business has the ability to service their current debt and any new debt um, and with with a little bit of a cushion, right? So we're, we're looking at it, uh, um, you know, that they have the the ability to repay the loan that we're that we're we're talking about on a historical basis, not on a projected basis, but they could pay if they had this loan on the books two years ago, last year, uh, and so forth. So um, for the conventional loans, we we would take, typically look for twenty to thirty percent of a of a down payment on the equipment or real estate. Um, and then our terms for traditional conventional loans for equipment, about five to seven years, we would go 15 to 20 years on real estate. Um, and then we would do any of our working capital lines. They would have to have the supporting um, accounts receivable and inventory to support th those lines of credits. Um, so um, the nice thing about uh, conventional loans is that the rates are a little bit more attractive, um, especially in this rate environment. Um, so if you've got an established business and you're looking to grow and you have that historical cash flow, we try to get you into a conventional loan first. Um, and, um, but, you know, with acquisition loans and with startups, we're talking about a lot of risk, uh, in regards to with the startups being a brand new business, um, uh, with no, no, we're going completely off of projections and, um, and then with acquisition loans, which we do a lot of, uh, these types of loans where someone is selling their business, there's a lot of goodwill in the business. Um, we will finance that goodwill um, up to 10 years. So if there's an existing business um, that's out there that looks attractive um, and the, the buyer is looking to cash out as much money as possible off of that goodwill, the SBA um, through our acquisition loan program, you know, really, really helps there. So, um, so what are the benefits of the SBA is for those acquisitions or startup loans um, for equipment, working permanent working capital, we can go 10 years um, on a term for the, those types of um, um, plans. Um, if it's real estate, we can go up to 25 years. So those extended uh, terms make the cash flows often work, you know, on some of these acquisition loans or uh, definitely help with the startups for the, uh, you know, having a, a, a smaller payment than our, our traditional loans would have. Um, so the other nice thing about SBA financing, and again, I'm talking about what we call the 7A program. And the reason why the why Huntington and, and other banks, and Huntington's the lead, leader in doing the 7A loans um, throughout the region and, and across the country, actually, for the last few years, um, is we get a guarantee from the government for anywhere from 75 to 85 percent. If a loan does go bad, we have like a backstop, a guarantee from them that they'll they'll help cover part of our losses. So we're willing to take that risk with the SBA guarantee. So we know we don't have enough collateral when we do an acquisition loan with with uh, with goodwill, but because we have that guarantee, we're we're a lot more comfortable doing that loan. Um, in that fashion. Um, so uh, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Which one is this at now? So can you see that? Yep. Okay. So, um, so Heinz is very dedicated to, to local business and, and helping kind of on, on the smaller end, some of these, these startups or acquisitions. So um, again, we use the SBA a lot, but we're kind of um, expanding it um, in regards to some of the things that we can do via that. 
Um, so again, we're, we're looking at, we've we actually made a $25 million dedication to this program to help uh, minority women owned veteran owned businesses. Um, you know, uh, also, you know, city of Kalamazoo, the, the, I guess, low, lower income, um, uh, communities. So we've really, um, you know, expanded this to, um, do loans as little as a thousand dollars up to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. We've basically we're going to pick up all the origination fees. Um, the SVA fees will be paid by us. Um, lower credit score requirements. That's probably one of the things that we get into a lot um, um, with some some startups. Maybe not um, the best credit scores because they um, uh, don't have don't have that much of a history. So we, we have some flexibility in regards to our, our credit scores with this program. Um, we also uh, work closely with uh, Operation Hope to get some free education classes uh, for these uh, uh, applicants that qualify that, you know, they'll, they'll work with Hope to help, uh, you know, improve their financial education. Checking accounts, we also have, you know, the flexible longer term repayment options. So um, so it's a, an offshoot of, of the SBA because we will be using SBA um, funds for this, but um, it gets us a little bit more uh, flexibility in trying to help uh, the smaller community with uh, these, these types of loans. Um, so for any of these loans, um, we would typically be looking for um, three years of financial statements. Uh, that's three years of personal tax returns, three years of business tax returns for you know, the existing business you have, or if you're buying a business, we need the, the tax returns of the existing business. Um, we require a personal financial statement, which is basically lists your um, uh, assets and liabilities. And then especially for the startup loans, um, we really want to see a business plan and projections on how this is going to work. And that's where we work kind of closely with Tamara and her group. And we, we often get a lot of referrals from them. They've already been, they've already done that process. They've already walked through and said, you know, this business is going to work. Uh, we've looked at the projections. So we, if they haven't done that already, we, we often say, hey, you know, uh, put this together. And if you need help, you know, go, go to Tamara's group at the SBDC because they, they'll do it for, for free. So, um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I don't know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer. Um, I do um, have a question. It says, do you have to be a certified as a minority business? Um, so I just jumped up there um, to qualify for this funding. Um, I'm not sure. Um, for the, I, I guess for your lift, for the lift and local business. Features, I, don't, I don't believe so, but I, 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 I'm not an expert. Okay. Um, so, and, and um, these loans, this lift program is 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 really um, done through our, our branch network. So, if anyone would be interested in in applying for the one of these lift loans, um, you'd probably visit your local Huntington branch and, and indicate that that's what you want to work through, and then that kind of goes through a, a program that the, is runs runs through our branches. Okay. Um, another question: Is a business plan needed for an acquisition loan? Yes. Uh, we want to see, uh, with an acquisition loan, um, a lot of times we were looking for, uh, you know, how are you either, how are you going to continue the business on in the fashion that you're, that it's going, or what are you going to add to it as well as your background in regards to that business too. Like how, you know, we're, you know, we're, if you're been a manufacturer and you want to buy a restaurant, you're probably, we want some experience in that industry. So that business plan and how. You, you have that capabilities to, to run the business um, and you have some practical experience to, to do that um, it is important, but you've thought out how you're going to, uh, uh, how the business is going to work over the next few years. I have a, an interesting question here. And I hope you can answer this. Um, if you are federally certified, certified as SDVOSB, do you know what that is? I do not know what that is. Uh, but the that state is, is moving... That is the service disabled veteran owned small business. Got it. Thank you. That makes sense now. Um, but the state is moving slowly at their level. Can the federal level help obtain the um, SBSD loan? 
Tamara, do you know anything about this? Um, he, I think he's speaking about your program, but you don't actually need the certification in order to apply for this program. Correct. Uh, as long so, as you're, as long as you can prove that you're a veteran, you're, you're, it doesn't, you don't need any certifications again right. at, at, at any of the requirements, right? That, that as long as you're a veteran, woman owned minority business, you don't need certification of that. Nope. And you can prove that you are a woman owned business because if you have an LLC and if there's actually a, a member, you know, multiple members in there, you would look at your operating agreement and how you set up that operating agreement. Are you 51% owner or above? Um, that's how you would prove that. If you're a single member LLC, well, you're a hundred percent of that membership. So, and obviously veteran, you have all your, your documentation that can prove that you're a veteran. Awesome. So if someone is going for an SBA loan, um, should they start with their own bank or is there a, um, that they already have history with? Is it easier to get your loan through your existing bank? Uh, traditionally, I mean, you know, some banks, again, Huntington is, is, you know, again, the largest provider of SBA loans. So we've got an expertise in it. So um, where some, some banks don't do that many, right? So they're, you're, you're going to, you know, it's, and they're and they're not easy to do if you don't do many of them, right? So I would say um, if you weren't going to use Huntington, I would say then I would say you know talk to your local bank for sure. And and if it's a larger larger bank, you're probably not going to have any problem. But some of the smaller banks, the community banks, um, sometimes don't have the same SBA um, expertise and might take a little bit longer. But um, it, it is they they have a personal record of you, so that that would definitely help. Great. I think at this point, those are the questions we have. And so thank you very much for sharing that, Kip. Um, if you have questions for your own bank or for Kip or for, um, it sounds like you should pop into your local branch um, to get most of your questions answered. So thank you very much for sharing all those insights. And we'll, we'll look for more, uh, more, more questions later um, as we go through. But I want to make sure we go ahead and have time for, for one of the other interesting people we have on here. We've got Dale Grogan with the Michigan Capital Network, who's gonna join us. Um, Kip, would you do us a favor and close down your screen? And Kip that. has left the room, okay. Kip, Kip has left the room. <laughs> Kip, could you unshare? <laughs> and then we'll go ahead and we'll invite Dale to the, to the Wonderful, stage. thank you. Thank you, Petey. Sorry <laughs> about my voice, everyone just struggling a little bit, but virtually, at least I'm not uh, dangerous to anyone, though triply vaccinated and flu shot as well. Sometimes bad luck. Anyway, thank you, Petey, for having me this morning. Thank you, Tamara, Molly, and Kip for your great comments about uh, how folks can access capital. I represent um, what some people might consider sort of the, the top of the food chain as it relates to access to capital, which is venture capital and angel investing. And what that sort of generally means uh, at a 30,000 foot view, well, let's start with what it does not mean. Shark Tank. Shark Tank is entertainment. It is not real. It is television. Now, there are some components of what occurs on the entertaining show, and I love it, by the way. Um, but what does not happen is somebody come in and spend 90 seconds pitching an idea and a billionaire says, I'll buy 30% of it for $100,000 and you get into a silly negotiation. That is not what happens. When, when you think about angel investing or venture capital, that is the most difficult capital to obtain. You have to jump through more hoops than you can possibly imagine. And all of the requirements that you heard earlier from Tamara, Molly, and Kip are just the tip of the iceberg. When you talk about business plans and when you talk about financial statements and when you talk about the need for all other sorts of background data, think about having to produce your patent applications and why you wrote them and explain your business. It's, it's a very, it's a very, stringent and strict and accountable 
uh, set of dollars that follow angel investing in venture capital. The reason why you seek this capital, however, is because it is not a loan. It is an investment into your company. So if the company fails, we don't come after you personally. You don't have to give us your house, right? But the quid pro quo is there is accountability that's required. This is the time where you run this business like a real business. And that business has to be scalable. This is not a sort of, I want to run, you know, a home brewery in my basement. That's not what venture capital is interested in. And let me be perfectly clear. Venture capital does not care about anything except money. Let's be brutally honest. It is not social capital. It is not impact capital, though there are funds that do that. And I'll give you one at the end of the talk that is investing specifically in BIPOC businesses. But the purpose of venture capital is to make money for its investors and for, and for the entrepreneurs, right? So it's, it's a very symbiotic relationship. I give you money to grow your business. You give me money back as a profit. So that's, those are sort of table stakes and how that works. And so when you think of the continuum of capital. Um, what you've heard is a very nice roadmap this morning. I'll put in a couple other signposts here. When you start a business, businesses almost always start with money from friends and family and self. So you start a company, you have a great idea. Let's say, let's say you have figured out a new way to, to manufacture a device that is revolutionary. It changes the world. This is, we're going from horse and buggy to, to car, right? That's, that's what we're looking for as investors. Revolutionary, not evolutionary change. So you have this idea. There, you, what you need to do to attract capital from angel investors is a little bit what Kip said. Demonstrate that you know this business not that you were a physician and you want to go into rocket science. You know, you have to, there has to be some sort of correlative skill set so that you understand the business, that there is opportunity, and that there is enough room in the competitive landscape for what you do. So you think about the four P's, right? It's the people, it's the product, it's the passion, and it's the potential, right? So when you think about the people, who are the people that are running this business? Have they done it before? Are they smart people? And do they understand what their business is? The product. Is the product something that is useful? Is it novel? Is it solving a problem that was heretofore not solvable? To have the 15th app that you can order your food on, you know, Uber 15, Uber Eats 15, who cares? The passion. Does the entrepreneur have skin in the game? Does he care about this? Is this all that he's doing? Is this life and death for the entrepreneur that creates alignment of interest? Uh, people have across in potential. Is this something that can be scalable? Is this something that is of interest to the population? And when you think about a drug, for example, a drug that can treat three people in the country is probably not as valuable as a diabetes drug that can treat 300 million. So you have to think about the scale of it. So as angel investors, what you want to do um, when, when an angel, when you're invited to present at an angel investor meeting, you have a 15 minute pitch deck and it tells your story. And a lot of the story is about the financial opportunities in front of you, which is I can with your money Take this business from $100,000 in revenue to $5 million in revenue. And then with some more money, we can go from $5 million to $50 million. Again, angel investors and, and venture investors are really um, somewhat altruistic, but really more capitalistic. So places where you can go in the ecosystem. There are places where you can get early dollars that are non-dilutive. That is, they don't cost you equity, right? And there's some grant programs that, that I'm sure Tamara runs and Molly has talked about hers as well. There are also state-sponsored from the MEDC, Michigan Economic 
Development Corporation, where there are early stage dollars that are available, typically attached to universities. So Michigan State University has one that's called the Red Cedars, uh, Red Cedar Program. There's Invest Detroit, which is an early stage investment fund. There is Invest Michigan, and there is Ann Arbor Spark. In Kalamazoo, there's an angel group called the Kazoo Angels. There is, that's part of our Michigan Capital Network, which is five different angel groups. Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Flint, Detroit, and Saginaw. Um, if you can get in front of the angels, be prepared to explain how you can go from where you are that you've already proven something, not I have a blank piece of paper and I, and I need your money, but rather I've built a prototype and I need to get into production. So you can start from there. And then your story is, and this is how I can, I can take this to a 20 million, a 50 million, a hundred million dollar company. If you can do that, and it's a cogent story that hangs together, you have a very good opportunity to get, to get funding. And the best part about being in front of these angel investors is their specific desire is to find investments. So it's it's a target rich community. And if you're in the Michigan Capital Network has 170 angels inside the network. So if you have a good story and you have some experience, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Last point I'll say is for those folks in the BIPOC community, there is a new fund that's been stood up in Grand Rapids called New Community Transformation Fund. It is specifically dedicated to investing in founders and operators of uh, folks of color, BIPOC. So it is a venture capital fund. So again, it is the most difficult to get those dollars, but it is dedicated specifically to the BIPOC community. And I will tell you that is very rare air. Um, folks of color, get less than 1% of venture capital funding. There are even fewer managers of color in the venture capital community. So this is a trend, it's happening. There have been $60 billion that have been dedicated to uh, investment for, for the BIPOC community. And um, it, is, it is a wave that's coming. And so we have, to, we have to recognize that and be prepared. What we as an in, in investment community must do is, uh, is pave the road and make sure that there are on roads and access to that. And in discussions like this, I think, uh, PD are very, very important for, for starting that. So I'll stop there. And if there are any, oh my gosh, I've talked too much. Sorry, <laughs> I'll be quiet now. Not at all, thank, thank you. you. It's really, really um, very interesting and really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you getting on. We can tell that you're not feeling 100%, but um, you're, your information was fantastic and uh, just really, really appreciate the information you provided. Um, before we kind of wrap up, are there any last comments or that um, either Tamara, Molly, Kip, Dale, that you wanna make as we, as we kind of wrap this up for today? I don't have anything, maybe just say reach out anytime. I think all of us are probably you know, willing and able to touch base with anybody at any time. We wanna help businesses, so. Thank reach out to us, use us, yeah. And I think the other thing is that there is, um, there, sorry, go, why don't you guys go ahead, Tamara? No, that's fine. I mean, I'm uh, same with Molly and, and Kip. We're all available to talk to you um, and we can connect you to all the different organizations, whether it's Molly or Kip or SCORE. Um, we try to find, you know, all of us on this committee or on this uh, talk today are all open to, to listen to everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you all. And it's, um, there's money out there and there's, there's opportunities. So if you are, um, you know, in the business and trying to, you know, find ways, here's some great resources and we'd love to connect you if that's something that you're looking for. So thank you so much for, to our amazing panelists for sharing some incredible information and kind of uh, shoring us up and I think giving us a little inspiration to continue to build our businesses. Um, so as we mentioned, we'll be following this up with information and contacts to all these different programs. And then also just want to let you know up next for our Business First series on um, December, in December 9th, <laughs> I'm so glad that, uh, that Kelsey's got this in the background. On December 9th, we will be having our next Business First, and it's what does Southwest Michigan First do? 
And really, we just want to make sure that you know what to contact us for and how we can connect you to the resources that are out there, because we typically will refer you to other sources. So we really appreciate everything that's out there. Um, again, we'd love to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield for their support of these programs. And we are wrapping up right on time. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And we hope to see you next month on December 9th. Have a great day.